Hi everyone, we've looked at the evidence around imagery scripting, giving you a bit of a background. In this video, we're going to look at how to actually do imagery scripting and looking at giving you a bit of a framework and a template of how you can employ it in your work. So first up, we want to have a bit of a look around about the framework of imagery scripting and how you can start using it. There are several different start points you could be looking at. Okay, so the first start point you could look at is looking at doing a safe place um, uh, exercise. And once you've done that, moving into uh, a, a recent life trigger, this would be the classic thing that you would use in terms of working at more of a schema based uh, way. So you'd be looking at a recent event that might have happened, it might have been something that's happened to the client last couple of days, recent trigger that might be related to their life pattern and problem. And you'd be looking at what do you see? What do you feel? Yeah. Okay, get a sense of that feeling, what you can see, and hold on to that feeling, and then get an image of a childlike related experience, a childlike trauma, big T or small t trauma. And from that point, we would be initially re-scripting this. Okay, so as you can see from the diagram, the, the start point A would be do a safe place, then move into a current life trigger, then move into a, a related a childlike experience and rescript from the therapist. Okay, the therapist would rescript the initial stage. But look, for a lot of clients, you might want to skip the safe place exercise altogether and just start from the uh, current life experience and then link that to a client's um, earlier experience and rescript this. And then as you're moving through the, the treatment, a lot of the time you get to know particular uh, events that might be really linked to a particular scheme or a particular mode. So then you might just go straight into doing uh, an early experience and rescripting that. And that would be the point C uh, example. So when we're looking at doing image rescripting, there are two phases and we'll talk a bit about this now. The first phase is when the therapist is entering into the image and the therapist is standing up for the client, reattributing uh, messages to external sources. Uh, it would be, the therapist would be providing safety and care and nurturance and this sort of thing. And the reason why we're doing that is we're really trying to create a model for the client. In terms of schemas, often the client feels so bad and feels to blame and that's their problem and they wouldn't be able to respond to themselves from the get-go. A person with a stronger healthy adult mode could, but clients that don't have this stronger sense are going to really struggle with this. In working with trauma, we're also trying to provide uh, a model uh, that helps reduce fear, it helps reduce shame and this sort of thing so the client can kind of see perspective and have corrective emotional experiences that allows them to later move to uh, phase uh, two. So phase two, ultimately we want the client to enter in, into the image and look after themselves. Now with clients with more kind of access one kind of problems, that's going to be a quicker process. Clients with more severe personality disorders, that can take a very long time. But it's helpful for you to think about that and to communicate that to the client because ultimately you want the client to be able to have that in their mind. And this is the point of me trying to do imagery. It's to be able to look after my myself as a child in the image and to have corrective feelings um, and to be able to have the strength of these feelings to override old schema material. So in terms of targets, we've talked a bit about this before, but some of the ways in to access decent, nice imagery material that you, that's gonna be meaningful for the client, you could just do a float back. When we talk about a float back, it might be just what we mentioned in um, the, the initial um, diagram of start point B, where we would get an image of a current event. What do you see? What do you feel? What's running through your mind? There are three different sequences I often really, really try to teach people to use. Start with visual, go with feeling, go with cognition, and then hold on to the feeling in your body, that feeling of inadequacy, and that, that idea in your mind that you're just a loser, and get an image of you when you felt the same way as a child. 
use cognitions and use meaning um, and cross, cross section that with emotion and you'll find a, a length, longitude and latitude and a good attunement to help you with better float backs. So just think the longitude is the cognition and the meaning and the latitude is the emotion. You'll be able to get a good connection there to be able to get good meaningful outcomes. Another thing you could possibly do is to think about clients getting memories uh, related to uh, schemas and modes and experiences and getting them to think about that out of session and almost have like a compendium or a, a list of, of material that might be related to different schemas and use this and you can use this as a primer for the client so if a person is triggered you could be saying you know is it, is it kind of like this feeling does that feel right and be able to use that uh, as a way to kind of move forward so we're going to be looking at the imagery rescripting uh, script here and you know we're going to be looking at this the sequence it's important for you to get the sequence correct so when we're looking at this sequence Initially, you want to start off with getting an image, okay? And you want to, if we're doing a float back, you want to start with a recent um, image. But what we're going to look at is start point C of going straight into a, an initial uh, trauma or initial, initial difficulty for the client when they're as a child. So you want to get that image of that uh, experience as a child. Where are you? What are you feeling? Where is it in your body? Um, you know, looking at what the feeling is, how does it feel, what's running through your mind. So again, what can you see, what can you feel, what can you think, what's running through your mind. And then you could possibly also ask, what do you need? Now in situations where there's uh, safety, for example, if it's a trauma-based situation, childhood trauma, you don't ask for this because you clearly know that they need some, someone to make it safe. But if it's something to do with deprivation or, or some subjugated kind of experience, that you could ask this as well. Once this is attained, then you want to enter the image and provide safety. So what we mean by the safety is we want the client to feel safe between themselves as a child and the antagonist that's there in the image. So we might set up a wall or um, put the therapist in between uh, the an antagonist, which is the, the maybe the caregiver or the bully or, or whoever's there with them that's causing them distress. And you know, ha you know, sit yourself between the two and make yourself bigger. You know, so you can use fantasy, this sort of thing. You can bring in childhood helpers and this sort of stuff to help have a corrective emotional experience. Now, in this situation, it's really important to get this safety sense, sense uh, set up uh, because if clients still feeling really anxious and really overwhelmed, then they're not going to retain and integrate the material that you're going to be using in the next stage. So I would be just checking in with the client. How do you feel? What's it like me there standing there in front of you between you and your dad? What's that like? How does that feel? Can you see me there? I'm there. I'm not going to let him near you. This sort of stuff. So ultimately, you know, the client's going to experience the feeling safe and protected. Then, once we've got safety uh, set up, then we're really just rescripting and creating a corrective emotional experience. So we might be challenging the parent. If it's a punitive parent, we want to go, to go in uh, in a very direct way. We want to be uncompromising and determined. In other situations, for a demanding parent, for example, we might be reasoning with them. With a guilt-inducing parent, we might be really highlighting uh, that you know children aren't responsible for having um, uh, for looking after the needs of the, of the parent or the caregiver. So we're really trying to get the corrective emotional experience. It's important if you've got a punitive uh, critic that you win the exchange. So if you've got a, a punitive or abusive antagonist, you really do need to take charge and, and really sort of um, be uncompromising un in terms of your approach. Once you've done that, then you're gonna be asking for the response. So I might be saying something like, okay, so I'm there, I'm talking to dad. Listen, leave Johnny alone. You're dealing with me and I'm not gonna put up with that, okay? Okay, what's happening now? How's dad responding? 
Now from that response, we could get a really good sense of how to respond next. It might be that the parent is upset or they're more angry or they're crying. You can deal with that as it goes. So for example, in this situation, dad's laughing at you. It might be, you are not gonna laugh at me anymore because I do not care about what you say. You're wrong and I'm right this sort of thing. So you need to win the exchange and to be able to stick up for the client and the image. Sometimes you might need to use fantasy or, or um, use other methods to be able to um, control the image. So other methods might include uh, using a, um, a pause or a you know, remote control to pause the image. Again, as we've mentioned, we don't want you to forward through the whole process of the traumatic event. So we want to get in at the point, the hot spot point of the dis, uh, difficulty, and we want to provide the corrective emotional experience before the client moves into more difficult material. So it's not a reliving experience. The client wants to uh, feel like these ex experiences are re-scripted rather than relived. So it's important to, if you find yourself jumping ahead, press pause, rewind, slow it down, bring yourself into the image. Uh, and that's usually very helpful to be able to get the client back into that window of tolerance so they're not feeling overwhelmed or underwhelmed. Um, and then we want to just continue with the dialogue. It might be one or two lines with the antagonist, sending the antagonist away, getting help for the demanding or the guilt-inducing uh, critic, this sort of thing. So being able to stick up for the client, but with in abuse and trauma kind of situations, you want to be able to send the antagonist away or have them arrested, all these sorts of things, uh, depending what the client needs. So I would suggest to check in with the client as you go, what do you need? What would be helpful? What do, what do you need right now? And see what the client comes up and responds to. Ultimately, again, this idea of winning the exchange is important and getting the tone right for the different type of antagonists that you've got in front of you. So think about, you know, how are you going to approach the different antagonists? For a punitive antagonist or abuse in this sort of situation, you want to be uncompromising, determined and really shut this down. For a demanding antagonist, you want to reason with the, with the, uh, the, the caregiver or the person in the image about realistic kind of um, pressure and realistic kind of um, ideas placed on the child. And possibly also with, uh, when you're working with neglectful antagonists, you want to work in terms of highlighting the needs of the child and the importance of this. So just a couple of key ideas in imagery scripting. First up is make it experiential, okay? I see this all the time when I'm listening to tapes of people doing imagery, is that you really want to make it an experiential exercise. So what can you see? What can you hear? What can you feel? Usually by just saying, what can you see? That's enough. Um, but what I do see is a lot of people recalling difficult experiences. And it's not about recalling, it's about experiencing. Okay? We could talk about bad memories and bad experiences rather than actually experiencing that. So the way to get around that is to say, what can you see? Okay, so just really get that line wrapped up for the client as early as possible. Another thing to think about is don't do interpretation or analysis. It just slows things down. You want to keep the process ticking along. So you don't want to really kind of do too much of that uh, within the imagery. You can do it after the imagery. That's not a problem. But just to keep that ticking over as you go. As I mentioned, get safety. So make sure that's all happening, particularly with you know, abuse or you know, traumatic events. And Two things to think about. If you get stuck and you don't know what to do, what would a good parent do, you know, and what do they need are two things that you can keep on, you know, using um, in terms of, you know, coming back to the basics of the model. One other thing is to think about is trying to make things first person and present tense. It's just a guideline, but it's often a good way of getting clients into the experience. So rather than saying, oh, I was sad at that time of my life, it would be, I'm there and I'm feeling sad, this sort of thing. So getting them in first person, present tense, as if they're there 
in the experience watching their caregivers interacting with them. So we're going to show you a little video now uh, of the experience of doing imagery scripting with um, patient uh, Nikki. Um, and in this exercise, we're going to be really commenting on the ideas around using uh, imagery scripting with more of a, a punitive, abusive antagonist. In this exercise, I'm quite strong with the, uh, with the antagonist and, and really it's about sort of shutting down the message of the abuser and being able to stick up for the client and have the corrective experience for them. Now remember, this is the first stage and then we'll be moving into doing the second phase later. In uh, different situations, you might be doing a lot of first phase imagery rescripting. Um, so in schema therapy, you might be doing months and months and months of this, if not years of this, but in a, working at a PTSD level, you might be you know, sort of doing half a dozen of these sorts of imagery exercises before the client feels able to take more responsibility and move into phase two. So I uh, leave you to this next video. And again, it's really good to get lots of comments and feedback and discussion. It's really helpful for me and for the other participants. And you can leave that in the discussion uh, part of the page below. Hope you enjoyed this presentation and uh, hope you enjoy the uh, exercise coming up next. Thanks.